shorting everyone, uh, a couple ground rules. Um, I'm going to talk about this copy subscription. And there's an internal um, challenge that we have going on where each of us have to sign up five to 10 people. <laughs> so I have some people on my team here. So any of you who sign up, get credit to me and not them. <laughs> so that's for them. Um, but the power of the stuff is my marketing. Now, when I, I'm realizing now you probably can't read a lot of this, so um, I'll, I'll walk you through some of this. But I swear most of the big pictures, you don't have to wait. Not a lot of charts and graphs, so we're good. Um, you know, when I've gone to conferences in the past, a lot of times I get in there and I see the list of speakers and the list of topics, and it can be overwhelming. You have everything from transparency, artificial intelligence, brand purpose, personalization, um, PMA, CDPs, DMTs, ARs, all those fun acronyms. And it can be overwhelming at times. You say, oh my god, like, do I have to do all of this to make sure my job is going to be successful? What's more important than the other? And, and you just get flooded with, with, with almost too much stimuli. So I'm going to try and keep this simple. And focus this conversation on disruption. Now it's going to take in some of these other topics along the way, but this is the easiest way, I think, to get across the story of Panera. It's really rooted in disruption. And by disruption, what I really mean is simply this idea of finding ways to break through the clutter that are powerful, that are differentiated, that are ownable, that are unique. And along the way, hopefully it's going to get some of you to change perception of both my brand and the category. If we do that, then we've done our job right. But all those words I showed earlier are in service of a bigger idea in my, in my um, it's a little bit of It's this idea of marketing that matters. So it's understanding your target audience and your consumers so well that you're going to create solutions to their needs. And that's what's critical. And every once in a while, some brands even raise the bar higher than that. They don't not only do marketing that matters, but they do marketing that makes a difference, makes a positive impact in this world. And that's what I'm here for, and that's what I love why I love working at Panera so much, because I think that's where we set the bar, how we can actually make a difference in this world. Um, so with that, what's really important at Panera, and I'd argue anywhere, for anyone, any, anyone in this room, is that all those ideas, this idea of disruption, this idea of marketing matters, all relies on this key word, which is trust. You have to build trust in your actions. When you think about trust, I can say anything I want to say. I can have the most disruptive campaign out there. But if people aren't actually willing to listen to the messenger, so to speak, it's just not going to matter. So let's talk about, I'm going to oversimplify for a second. I have to at least do some nods to my fellow Pepsi days. <laughs> there were a lot of other pictures where I didn't think of this day and age are quite appropriate. They were like 10 years ago, were appropriate. Very, very funny. But I look at this and say, you know, Back when there was some simpler times, if you will, and you had the radio and the TV, and you could just shout and out shout people, and that would be maybe considered disruptive. There's a simple formula. You you'd have a strong brand name represented by a big brand, a big company that people were well aware of. You slap on some spokesman who people loved, and that essentially was trust. You, you, you believed that whatever they said, well, they must they don't know must know what they're talking about. We're going to buy whatever they're telling us to buy. Now, yes, I'm oversimplifying, but I see something about Ronald Reagan. Suggesting cigarettes or pretty student Pepsi it just, just makes you laugh a little bit. It's longing for the old days. But what happened, I think we all know, this is kind of an obvious statement, but people started trusting less. There was more information. And they started getting in completely overwhelmed with information and advertising messages. So the average message, uh, the average consumer today is running into about 5,000 to 10,000 messages a day. And you know, at, at best case, it's mostly white noise. Worst case, it's just really, really, a lot of stuff really bad, right? I mean, we see it. Um, I don't see a whole turnover, but that's a whole other, other topic, I suppose. Uh, but the idea is that people simply don't trust big advertisers anywhere like they used to. And that's just, that's just the reality. If you don't believe me now, some of you might not be able to read this, so I'll walk you through it. Rate the honest, honesty and ethical standards of people in these different fields. I could have done this as sort of interactive, but I'll. Nurses, 84%. Police officers, 54%. Advertising practitioners, 13%. Now, there's some good news. I'm, I'm, a, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a glass half full kind of guy by nature. So, we do lose lawyers, but we do meet members of Congress. So just hold that deep, hold that deep. Now, I'll tell you, I looked at this, I mean, this has not changed. Three years ago, same numbers. So just as an FYI. And then a little more, I don't want to say doom and gloom, but the reality, a little more reality check that everyone knows. Right? With the arrival of social media, information is everywhere. There are no secrets anymore. 
And everyone has a voice to talk about your brand, and some have a very overt voice, a big pulpit to talk about your brand. Now, sometimes that can be awesome. I'll read this. This, this is a fun part. Panera commercial makes me feel warm, happy, and now I want to go there. And by the way, none of these are my people or me, just <laughs> or relatives, as far as I know. Uh, this Panera commercial gets me excited to have a Panera. And stupid Panera commercial made me want a salad. That's good marketing. But all right, so we can end on that. But then you get this. Whoever John Barbone is, I know. It's not pronounced Kasha, it's Kasha. Fire your marketing team. <laughs> oh, geez, all right. Uh, actually, quick aside on this, and uh, she is here, so I asked my head of, head of social media, uh, Andrea over there, uh, Andrea over there, to say, hey, can you find me some, some recent quotes where people said, you know, your marketing's no good or part of your marketing team? She came back and she said, ah, I can't find anything, you know, it's the last one we have is from 2016. I said, oh, great, we'll just use that one. Then I thought about it about an hour or two later, and I said, was there not, or did she just say there's not? You know, it's just like, hmm, like that. But anyways, I'll trust her, I'll believe that there's, there's actually nothing there. All right. So, you know, like a brand's doomed. No, not at all. I don't mean to be doom and gloom. The reality is, though, that people have got a little more jaded, uh, or, or at least indifferent. You know, so brands need to remember this importance of building trust, and that's what's made Panera so powerful over the years. So, before I get into all the disruptive marketing we're doing, I want to keep reinforcing that over and over and over again. But you can't end there, because yeah, if you have brands to trust, it doesn't mean that you're gonna be receptive to listening to what they have to say all the time, or, or just taking everything they say as, 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 as gospel. So that's where these words come in. Relevance and disruption. So as a senior leader at Panera, everything I wanna do is to inspire trust in my consumer. As a senior marketer at Panera, I have to make sure when I'm talking to that consumer that I'm giving them relevant information and relative tools and relative solutions to their needs. And then I have to do it in a very disruptive way because it's all it's all relative. I have a, a budget that some would say absolute terms, pretty probably pretty sizable compared to a lot of startups compared to other things, but compared to the big guns, we're, we're the ninth largest con restaurant concept in America. And I don't think a lot of people realize that. We don't spend like the ninth largest. We spend a lot a lot sort of lower than that. That's my question in case my boss sees us. I want them to hear that. But <laughs> need more money. Uh, but, but the point is that we're getting out, out yelled. We're, we could try and take on this idea of fresh, fresh baby. But somebody spent 10 times to 15 times what we spent for 10 years straight talking about that message. So I have to find smarter ways to do it. And I have to be more disruptive when I do it. So with that, let's get into this and talk about the situation Panera's been in for the last five years. I'm going to walk you through over the last five years what we've done to disrupt the marketplace. Mostly in the, in the marketing space. I'm going to focus, by the way, mostly on the creative side. Um, you know, we have lots we can talk about loyalty, personalization, all that. But I think um, for this audience, it'd be most important uh, to talk about, or most relevant to talk about the creative process. So this is the situation we're in in 2015. Food advertising was quote unquote the sea of sameness. I just love that term. Everything looked the same. Everything was sort of biting smile shots. It showed juicy pictures of close-up uh, uh, crepe roll items. And everything looked the same. But we knew we had something different in Panera. So we had a clear challenge. We had to find ways to elevate ourselves out of that category and separate ourselves so that we could stand out, especially, like I said, if we don't have some of the dollars that the others have. And we didn't have a history of spending up until probably six, seven years ago. So here's the only other chart I have in the whole, whole you know, the first chart was kind of fun. This is the only chart I have in the rest of the presentation. And I'll talk you through it because I know it's probably tough for some of you to see. We have to figure out what matters to our consumers. So this is percent of business by customers, top ranking what they're looking for. So the four largest spaces, which made up 65% of our total visits, you had get your money's worth, you had easy and reliable, you had satisfied craving, and confident in my choice. So we have to think confident in my choice is that idea of sort of good good for you, the space we play in. So we have to figure out where can we play, where can we win, where can we disrupt? And we're going to be pretty tough to do money's work. We're not going to, we're not going to be, we're not going to be the dominant value. Um, you being reliable, we just don't have the convenience in some places. We're somewhat, but, but not as much. Satisfied or craving, yeah, we better be craveable. But we don't think that we can win and stand out on that. So confident my choice is the place we chose to play. And the good news is we have a lot of history in doing so. And Karen alluded to a lot of this. So I'm going to walk you through a couple other pieces just to drive it home. And this was all based on our founder, Ron Shea his phenomenal work over 30 years when he was at the helm. Um, he always was phenomenal at predicting what's next and what we should do um, that's gonna resonate with the consumer. 
He also is great at understanding how to get ahead of the consumer a little bit. So, um, so in other words, I can take any credit from the here before. Um, but in 2004, we introduced chicken raised without antibiotics, and strawberry poppy seed and chicken salad. That RWA raised without antibiotics didn't really exist back then. It's the point that we got so much people, we got skate so much interest that others started realizing that, hey, maybe they should be offering that too. By other concepts offering that too, we were able to raise the demand, raise the supply at lower prices. So again, that, that, that's making a difference. We allowed, we opened the doors for others to join. And yes, it hurt our differentiation a little bit because everyone else is joining that, joining that path, but it's the right path to do. And as long as we stay one step ahead, we're not too worried about it. We voluntarily removed all our trans fats, artificial trans fats from our meal in 2007. And 2010, the first national restaurant company to voluntarily display caloric information on our menu boards. And look, we have some, we have some, have some bagels that aren't exactly 100 calories, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it was a risk. I mean, there was not a lot of data to say, like, uh, you know, we should or shouldn't do it. But we knew it's just the right thing to do. We knew that consumers would trust us more, and we knew that would help us figure out what we need to do next. Then kind of alluded to it. June 2014 was a big watershed moment for us. We announced plans to make our food 100% clean by removing all artificial preservatives, sweeteners, flavors, and colors by the end of 2016. That was a big moment for us. What was important about clean food is that we knew we could be completely transparent. That was one of those words I think that was up in the narrow bingo. Um, that we, we really relied heavily on scrap differentiation because we're proud of what we have in our, in our, in our food. So we knew we could talk it's celebrate everything that's all the good that's in our food, and at the same time, remind people of all the stuff that really shouldn't be in their food, and that's all the artificial ingredients. And it's great. It's, it's a really funny story because we have, when we did it, a lot of people came out and said, you know, a lot of us, the, the science community said, well, you need those artificial ingredients. And uh, you know, Ron always had what I thought was just the greatest line ever when he said, look, we believe it tastes better. You may or may not be right, but I've never had one consumer come up to me and say, you know what? I wish you'd put it back in, right? It's a powerful, powerful opportunity for us. But the reality is, at that time, we were not making it part of our marketing message. We were going in a different direction around this idea of warmth and community. So uh, we mentioned that about 2015, I was named the interim CMO. And I don't know, if have any of you ever held an interim title? <laughs> OK. So interim CMO is basically a way of saying, well, you got a year to prove that you actually have some value before you move on. <laughs> So status quo doesn't really work for interns very well. Um, so uh, at the time, we hired Anomaly, it's just a phenomenal agency out of New York City. Um, and we, we partnered and said, you know what, I think we can do this differently. I think we have a bigger opportunity here. We believe that clean, although a lot of people didn't really understand what it meant at the time, could be the, the actual centerpiece of the campaign that became this idea of food as it should be. We're going down this direction, I, I now remember the tagline was, together we eat. And it was good. And it reinforced what Panera really was up until that point, but didn't talk about what Panera could be down the road. So we went with this idea of food as it should be, we locked in on this idea of clean, and then we just wrote it hard. And now I want to talk to you about some of the disruptive ways we did that. Because food as it should be in the clean platform became the anchor of everything we did. It gave us a platform to differentiate from the category in a disruptive way. So end of 15 going to 16, we started talking. And we used a full, typical, fully integrated campaign to do so. I'm just going to show a couple, couple pieces here just to, just to put it in your heads. What's been really successful for, successful for us over time, I'm going to have a number of examples, is really using social media and PR hard. We came up with this idea of the no-no list. It was an easy line to handle people could get to talk about all the ingredients we were taking out of our food. And it became picked up by the, by the press, all across social, and that was sort of the, the, uh, the point we call it per back to. So people didn't have to understand, they didn't need to remember what, what we're taking out. So wait, you're taking out preservatives, wait, sweeteners, flavors, what? So, look, we have a no-no list. There's a lot of bad stuff that shouldn't be in it. We're taking it all out, and everyone else should follow us, and we hope everyone does. Ron, at the same time, the founder at the same time, came out and did a, uh, a letter to America about how he wanted to make sure that, that he could serve food, um, he, he could um, serve food that he'd be proud to serve his, his kids. Uh, he talked about how he wanted to challenge the food system, challenge everyone to step up, and how we could all get better. If we all work together, all the restaurant concepts, we could collectively make a huge difference. What I loved about this campaign, though, is it allowed us to richly storytell. 
So let me give you one example of how we started talking about this idea of clean to put it in people's heads early on in 2016 or so. We're currently standing in front of the Boys and Girls Clubs of Bell Gardens. This club has been around for 40 years serving the community. But in 2015, a storm came and devastated the club. We had 300 kids signed up ready to go, and we had to shut it down. I grew up here. This neighborhood has some hardworking families, but I worry about kids not having a safe place to go to after school. We have seen over the last two years since this club has been closed an increase in, in juvenile activity. A location like the Boys and Girls Club that provides direction, it's huge for the kids. to the Bell Gardens Boys and Girls Club. If they're here, we know that they're not on the streets. They're in a safe environment with other kids, and that makes me happy. They were so excited to be here, and I could tell that they were looking around and, you know, overwhelmed, I think. This means the world to me. You invest in kids and you invest in families, then you're investing in a community that helps everyone. finger at anyone or we're saying do this and we, didn't, we never want to be the food police, we never want to be your mom telling you what to eat and what not to eat. We just want to do the right thing and we're always on this journey to get better. And that's a, that's a really important part for us to say what else can we do differently to help change the system. So that was just one way we started talking about it. Um, but we also want to have a little fun with this too. So we made a lot of bold statements along the way. And here's one that we, we, had, we had a lot of fun with. We, we wanted to talk about and highlight our clean uh, it's a clean kids meal. Keep a, it's a clean kids meal. So what we meant by that is that our, we believe that kids meal should be clean, it should be full of delicious options, it should be worthy of trust, it should be nutritious, nutritiously paired, and drink optional. We believe that you should have to have the, the toys and everything. People should just want, the kids should want to go there because they love the food, and the parents should be feeling great about giving them that food. So we had some fun, and we had Ron out there on social media challenging the other CEOs, the Wendy's and the Burger King and the McDonald's of the world, to eat their uh, kids' meals for a week. And we did it in a very sort of fun, sort of lighthearted way. We weren't finger pointing too much, just sort of a, um, I honestly, I couldn't find the clip that we had from it. It's been so long, but it was a great moment at the time, and, and crickets, we gave him back. We actually were at a conference about two years later when the Wendy social media uh, uh, contact, who was, they've done brilliant work there, they basically said we so wanted to respond but we knew anything we responded would open us, ourselves up because we came from that, we came from that position of rights. So it worked, worked really well. But we also want to make sure we do some things that are a little more fun and lighthearted, that still brought, brought home this idea in a powerful way, but did it in our own voice. So we put this out uh, in the digital space as well around that same time. What is an app ball? Mm. It's like a circle. There's three colors to it. Red, yellow, and green. It's very sweet. Sometimes it's sour. What is sodium benzoate? Mmm, 
Probably like a really, really big egg that's red and has one eye. He's the, the guy who likes to ruin everything. He doesn't even hold the door and he lets it close on people. He's like a lone wolf kind, maybe. So I brought the, you know, we, we had a team, we had the full, full gamut, but I wanted to show some things we did in the digital space because we really, really emphasize the digital, social, and PR space for, for this campaign for the last three or four or five years now. Now, the results of all this were pretty powerful. So we had Forbes saying, we may be the most influential brand right now. We had the Times saying, given Panera's track record in the rest of the industry, you might just be a few years behind. Today's show, Panera's making it easier for people to do the right thing. All powerful. Trade press is always strong. But this is what I like more. We had third-party advocates, you know, what we call it now influencers, right? We didn't pay them, we didn't talk to them about this at all. But on their own, we had people like Bobby Flay saying, I think Solar Panera is paying attention. I applaud Panera for doing this. We had the food bay, uh, food activists and bloggers saying, I appreciate Panera's commitment to remove artificial ingredients and hope other major restaurant chains take notice and do the same. Very powerful for us. So what happened? Just that. That didn't happen overnight. The one thing we loved about the clean, uh, the clean platform for us was quite candidly, we know we could do it, we knew it was the right thing to do, but we knew others would have a real challenge to get there. We wanted them to get there, we offered to help people get there, but in the end, it's difficult. It's costly, it uh, takes a lot of resources and a lot of know-how, and if we come from that space, so we were able to do it, we'd have first mover we knew for two, three years. Um, but we we're happy to see McDonald's go clean. Um, now, when you read the five, I know no one's here from McDonald's, so it's okay. But, um, McDonald's goes clean with seven hamburgers. What they didn't tell you is they actually didn't clean the pickle. They cleaned everything but the pickle. So it's kind of weird when they pick and choose what they did. Um, I'm still mad at myself that we didn't come out and say, hey, we can help you with the pickle. You need it. We're here. But we missed out. It still bothers me to this day that we didn't take advantage of it. Um, but this was kind of fun. Not only did it help uh, you know, people food, but it helped dog and cat food as well. So I don't know if anyone saw this, but about a year ago, Petco came out and said, we can get rid of all our artificial stuff from our pet food as well. And then of course, who recognizes this? Yeah. Right? I'm such a huge fan of Fernando Machado down in Burger King, because that guy is just fearless. He will take chances and, here, actually let's just do this for fun. Alright, if you were in his if you were the CMO at the Burger King, or the CEO, whoever, and uh, you're Offered to do, you know, your CMO, let's say this, your CEO, the CMO comes up and says, hey, should we run this? How many of you would say this was a good idea and we should run it? One. How many wouldn't? Wow, okay, all right. Actually, let's see, well, let's see, we got to see which hands raised. No, I knew Carrie was going to be the only person who was going to raise I didn't even have to turn around. <laughs> yeah, regardless, clearly here's what we're happy about. This is the result of movement we started four, four years ago. And we applaud them for doing it, because we actually are making a difference then. And we had enough, enough first mover advantage that allowed us to somewhat reap the benefits for a while. Now we get everyone caught up. Same thing with Raised Without Antibiotic Chicken, and now it's up to us to figure out what's that next, next thing we're going to do. So let's talk about disruption beyond clean. We wrote clean, I think, it's funny, because as an as advertiser, I think sometimes we get sick of ideas before consumers do. So we say, well, we have, we, we've done clean, check, let's move on. There's still not great awareness of it. There's still a lot more we can do. So I think we have to strike that balance, making sure we still drive home that point, but realize that we can't hang our hat just on that point anymore. So that's what we're working on. Well, let's talk about some of the other things we've done in the last couple of years. So in support of this, we take, we get all our, our food, get it clean, we're very proud of our food. At the same time, we're serving um, our, our Pepsi, uh, our coming from Pepsi, so it's kind of interesting. Um, I'm not sure I'm looking back at Pepsi when I tell you about this, but, uh, <laughs> We wanted to make sure people understood that they had options, real options. We came out with a line of non-carbonated beverages. At the same time, we weren't willing to go and just rip all the soda machines out because people wanted them. And that's not our, that's not our role. We don't see that as our role to say, you must have this, you must not have that. But what we did want to do is be as transparent as possible and make sure people knew what they were drinking, what they were putting into their system. So we figured, you know, people can list grams, but uh, another great Ronism, but so the only people who know what grams really are our drug dealers from Walter White. <laughs> so, uh, I gotta get some own, some own quotes of my own, I guess, uh, running out of this. But the point is, we started putting, it's tough to see, but above all our Pepsi machines, we put out little teaspoons, little teaspoons of how much sugar is in each. 
We have fully sweetened, medium, lightly, unsweetened, and then our whole non-carbonated line. So we want to make sure people understood what was in their cup. No more, no less. Make sure they had their options and choices. So we're not ripping it out, but at least people are aware. Um, yes, Pepsi was not too happy with us at the time, but it was the right thing to do. And we found a lot of fun ways to talk about this, but that just, this in and of itself got a ton of press, a ton of exposure from us, especially on the consumer side. And this is perhaps my favorite. So anyone, anyone here about that? I'm not sure, this is probably about two years ago now, a year and a half ago. Um, we petitioned the FDA to have a clear definition of what constitutes an egg in restaurants. Because, well, here's a simple, simple, simple quiz. How many ingredients do you think are in our eggs, in Arrow's eggs? God, I hope so, right? One. It's an egg. One. That's the right answer. One. I'm not going to say who the competition is, but there are other places in the breakfast space and the culture. We harness these disruptive ideas, both to drive PR and social media. And Chrissy Teigen up here on the right. Chrissy Teigen came up and said, yes, I, I agree. Only actual eggs should be called eggs, and their broccoli cheddar soup should be called delicious cream times. We didn't we had no relationship with Chrissy, but of course we jumped on it. So the first thing we did was respond and say, thank you, we agree, that sort of stuff. We have to be careful we can't, can't say it's a deal endorsement. But what we immediately did, within 24 hours, we created delicious cream time soup and changed our entire website to broccoli cheddar to delicious cream time soup. It got a great response. She, she, she tweeted back. We had all sorts of fun back and forth. It got picked up by the press. It's that sort of quick, nimble reaction time that, that I was really proud of the team for, for handling. Another example. I don't know if anyone remembers this at all, but uh, last year we had people in the co-worker of the St. Louis, uh, today I introduced my co-workers to the St. Louis secret of Morning Bagel's bread sliced. It was a hit. Does anyone remember this at all? Yeah. yeah. So what happened was that um, someone tweeted that out. We, uh, Andrea team, quickly responded to it. Um, and that started the conversation. And that conversation went nuts. It went everywhere. People taking sides. We uh, took advantage of, we started putting billboards up in St. Louis within 20, digital billboards, within 24 hours. Uh, it looked something like this, like the eight card of the election season, St. Louis crowd. We're also, so those of you might not know it, but in St. Louis, which is the origin of Panera, we're actually called St. Louis Bread. Everywhere else we're Panera, I probably should mention that. Uh, we, had, we had Andy Cohen talk about it, we had the mayor of New York weighing in, we had all sorts of people weighing in. Again, just from a simple idea, of finding ways to be disrupted, it works. We created a double bread bowl for Valentine's Day. So you can share it with your friend. Uh, and, went, and went nuts. And then we just had some really, like, this isn't really disruptive per se, it was just really smart listening on the social media team. Um, and again, I'm, I'm going to show my age on this one. Because apparently there's a saying, uh, let's get this bread. Uh, who knew that saying? A few. Okay. I didn't. Um, but apparently, people on my team did. And we just, uh, we took advantage of just we tweeted out, good morning, Eric, let's get this bread. 139,000 retweets, 279,000 likes. Something nice and simple. So we had a lot of fun with this whole idea, and we really spent a lot of time on social media and PR and use that to disrupt. Because that's the way you can do it effectively and efficiently. And hopefully just smartly. So we also harness the power of transparency to reinforce our leadership and disrupt the media landscape as well. So we created this digital video series last year called Food Interrupted, where we took Everyday heroes trying to change the food system from within, and paired them with great chefs and told their stories. And as we did this, we made sure we focused on stories that were relevant to us, and places that we should have a point of view on, or, or places where we've actually made some commitments. So things like real eggs, light clean, light meat raised without antibiotics. Let me show you a trailer of Food Interrupted from last year hard enough to eat healthy as is, let alone if you don't actually know what you're eating. We produced a lot of food for the last six to seven years, not based on what was healthy for us. It's not just about eating kale and carrots all day long. You have to look at what's in the ingredients. We have just put animal products as the star of the dish. I don't think it has to be that way. One of my biggest fears, not wanting to cut time with my son short. Chefs need to lead by example, and Panera, who is one of the big guys, is leading by example. Grow what you can mm -hmm. and in the space that you have. And it tastes much better. This is grass-fed meat right here. Oh, that's so much better, it isn't even funny. It's a very honest taste. You don't need all these additives to make something great. A fresh egg is just a fresh egg. Eat something like that and then you think, this is a lifestyle I could be committed to.
So again, we cast personalities as policy issues. They were mostly like they weren't all chefs, Rain is exactly chef, but uh, the others are, we had a lot of fun with it. Now, a couple things I want to bring up about this, and I want a quick quick aside to it. So A, we're coming out with it again. Uh, we're coming out uh, in about two, three months. The trailer's not quite ready. Um, and I'll talk about what we did to support this, but what's really interesting and it hit me was that this was an idea that was an anomaly's original pitch back in 2015 that we didn't do until 2019. And it brings up a lot of thoughts. It, the pitch didn't look like this. The pitch was Ron, our founder, having a fireside chat with people who were trying to change the, the food industry from the inside out. We loved the idea. It was called Breaking Bread. And I'll break you bad, that idea. Um, TMY is probably going to do that anyway. But, but the point was that we knew something was there, but we just never could quite find like, what that unlock was. So we waited a couple years. always just sat in our back pocket, but we knew it was a good idea. And I, uh, eventually, uh, not only in a couple of folks internally on my team, took another swing at it and said, like, you know, what if we position it this way? Except they were just dogging and bowling, and eventually said, like, yup, we nailed it. So the lesson for me is, is you know, if you have a good idea, keep fighting for it, keep working at it. I mean, every year, an anomaly would come back. Say, come on, let's just do it. We're going to do it on our own. We're going to spend it. Like, I knew they wouldn't. I knew my HR. They wanted to say that. But the point was that we never quite nailed it until about three, four years later. And then it all kind of came together. So I, I urge all of you, especially some of you junior folks, to not give up when you have a good idea. And be vocal, be loud, and keep pushing, pushing, pushing. And eventually, if the idea is strong enough, it will get through. So, anyways, I just wanted to bring that up. I thought it kind of hit me that this is something that took four years to make um, and didn't hit right away in 2015. But just to reinforce, so what we did is we created a fully integrated content to commerce content brand. We had distributions of options and posts, which so actually helped um, offset a lot of the production costs. We worked with Soul Pancake, which is Rain, Rain, uh, um, Rain's uh, production group. We then had this episodic content series. We had brand activation. We used our loyalty program we really talked about it as well. We had great talent activation and promotion who supported it. A lot of these folks, but they were dying for a big pulpit to talk about what they wanted to do. And they didn't have that pulpit without someone like us. And a lot of these folks wouldn't want to do it with others. They want to make sure they had a brand that they believed in. That goes all the way back to what I talked about with trust. We didn't have trust. We didn't have that at the forefront of what the brand was. We would have gotten half these people, if not all of them. We had a call to action, so every time at the end of each series, we'd make sure that there was something that we were asking the consumer to do. Um, we had limited one-time only menu items. We actually had uh, um, Kevin create a, 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 a gray mold for us, and we sold it in certain cafes. Uh, TV interstitials, and we had spin-offs. We took that idea and we blew it out across other distribution points, uh, like the players you're reading. So it's a phenomenal idea. Really proud of the team. We ended up performing, outperforming everything we expected. So, well, I said the calls to action, we had things like 60 grand raised for beyond type 1 diabetes. And within an hour, we basically, when we put this thing out, uh, an episode on sugar and diabetes, we had people tweeting, uh, donating. We matched what they donated, and that could have gone higher. Probably oh, should have been I was Emmy nominated, which we're excited about. Um, successful LTO tests. We had 160 grand mentions, 317, 317 million earned impressions. So we're really excited to try these things. And sometimes, look, I'm not sure. Like, I could do a whole 30, 40 minutes of things that failed that we did too. But when you're smart, you take some chances. I think you have to accept that sometimes. We knew we wanted to get beyond just a standard approach, like slap on a TV ad, put some radio behind it, throw on an ad at home. Like, in our world, we're not going to win in that world because we don't have the dollars to compete with the big boys. We've got to find other ways like this to, to break through. So now we are in 2020, and we're not slowing down at all. So this is a picture of French onion soup. So really, really, it's a really grainy picture of French onion soup. Uh, but occasionally, and, and most restaurant concepts do, do this, you have seasonal items come in and come out, and how we have, we have only so much room to do certain items. So when we add something in for a season, sometimes we have to take something out. So occasionally we take out items that are popular. So we took out our French onion soup to put in something that was more relevant for the fall and winter uh, season. And boy did we hear it. So just lit up, people complaining, yelling at us, screaming, what are you guys doing? Now we always knew we were going to come back with it, and we typically do it. But for once we said, you know what? There's got to be a way to take advantage of this turmoil. Um, that's going to help us and help the consumer and show them that, hey, we get it, we're with them. Um, and, and that we're not completely interested. That's always the side So let me show you exactly what we did. Taking French onion soup off the menu has really taken a toll on our social media team. We had to hire extra help to deal with all the comments. At Panera Bread, bring back French onion soup, you cowards. Yeah. Okay. 
You should be ashamed of yourselves. I am. At Panera doesn't have French onion soup, and this is mid-key ruining my life. Okay. I just want some f Ooh, French onion soup at Panera Bread. F you. Wow. Terrible. Needless to say, everyone's really happy that French onion soup is officially back. Please stop messaging us. This job has its perks. See my loafers? Aren't they cool? I get to wear them all day long. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so Phil's actually is a St. Louis, and that's a real name, Phil's, is, is a St. Louis native. Um, what I love about this idea is A, we took a bad situation, we had to turn it off, turn it on, turn it on its head, and turn it into a good situation. Um, but I also want to highlight that this was an internal idea. We had a couple of folks on my team brainstorming saying like, hey, how do we take advantage of this? And this is all, one of them was actually the one we saw, our social media manager, Boo Dash, created uh, with a couple other folks and said like, hey, let's do this. We did it on the cheap, got Phil Slokely. Um, she loved to do it, it was relevant, it was right down the street for her. And it turned into a great hit for us. So 10 million total video views, you know, 8,000 shares on Instagram. You know, you know, it's funny, when you see like millions and billions of impressions, all the numbers start just kind of sounding the same. So I'll just say, a lot of impressions. It all kind of sounds like right? But, uh, and we had huge associate engagement. So that's another push. I really haven't pushed that in this, in this conversation yet, but um, we have 150,000 associates. And whenever I talk to them in any sort of big forum, I always end with the idea that like, look, we can do all the best, best messaging we want, but our single most important marketing tactic is our 150,000 associates. Because they're the ones on the front line. They're the ones who are talking to consumers every day. So no matter what we say, if they come in and have a bad experience, we're done. On the opposite side, even if we don't do our job well, but they have a great experience, it still works for us. So for someone like us, anything we can do for something like uh, for us, anything we can do to heighten our associate engagement is a really, really positive thing. I had to go up to Nick too. So I did ask the team for a slide. I'm like, hey, can you give me this, this uh, quick slide? I want to get um, this quote, and I couldn't find it. Um, this is the best ever. Great way to market. Great job at Panera and Phyllis. <laughs> and they said, do this. Good job, Panera. Someone deserves a raise for creativity. And they added, this guy makes a valid point. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't think I'm just going to kind of slide that by or subliminally on that thing, but I had to talk. I thought it was awesome. <laughs> We're still in discussions on that one. <laughs> uh, okay. The last thing I want to talk about. Um, so, I'd be curious to know, have, how many people here have heard of our new Koch subscription program? Wait, hold on, hold on a second. <laughs> this is important. How many people have heard of our Koch subscription program? That's the CEO. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good, good. Well, we, um, you know, we, we came out with this thing and talking about disruption. We're not going to win head to head with the Dunkins, with the Starbucks on our coffee. Yes, our coffee is quality. It's a Robica beans. It's a hundred percent. It's all the things that sort of check the box that you kind of need for an ante, right? Um, to make it quality coffee. But if we come out and we spend whatever we spend, uh, saying, "Hey, we got great coffee," like, yeah, sure, but everyone else does too, and they're much more well known for it, and we're just going to be drowned out. We've never been there. It's a small percent of our business. But what we do know that we have coffee as good as our food. And we know the other folks often don't have the food as good as their coffee. But we knew we had an opportunity here. So we tested this thing, this unlimited coffee subscription. And we started talking about it about, about a week and a half ago. We just went above the line uh, last night. And so far, it's going really well. I can't really talk too much about it. But I do want to talk about the idea behind it, because we knew this was a way to disrupt. Um, we also, through testing, knew that we could uh, hopefully not only benefit from the subscription, but benefit also from the race awareness of our coffee in general. And hopefully people in their minds tie coffee to our great food. And ultimately when they come in, if we can increase, increase transactions, something that everyone in our category right now is dying to do, that's gonna be a good thing. Because they come in, they get their coffee, and hopefully that we upsell them on, on food, right? And that looks like how it's playing out, playing out so far. We've had four billion impressions on, uh, again, these numbers start sounding kind of ridiculous. You know, and, and how you, how you, how you um, quantify them. But four billion impressions right now, and we're getting the types of headlines you dream about. If I can be in the same sentence as Netflix, it's awesome. Netflix for coffee, Panera offers $8.99. Um, Panera's new unlimited coffee deal will have you kissing Starbucks goodbye. Not a bad headline either. And the reality is, like, God forbid this thing doesn't work out as beautifully as we hoped. 
time to increase our business. There's tremendous upside with pretty much little downside. We'll see what people come back with, and we'll see if, if they even respond. We might not be, we might be off their radar, but so far the results are really strong. Now we also capitalize on this because there's breakfast sports going on right now. So Wendy's is coming out with a whole new breakfast menu. McDonald's counters with free egg McMuffin Day. Uh, Dunkin' counters with free donuts every Friday. We typically don't play the price game with a free game, so this is our first, our first thrust into value, if you will, but we want to in a Panera-like way. Um, but we're hoping to capitalize and, and take advantage and almost ride on the coattails of this quote unquote breakfast wars. And like I said, so far out of the gate, we're really pleased with the results. But if all of you could sign up, that'd be I appreciate it. Drop my name. Not my, not their name, my name. <laughs> okay, so let me show you the TV ad we had for this, just breaking uh, a couple days ago. Introducing an unlimited coffee subscription for $8.99 a month. At Panera, your cup is always full. All right, so I have to show these one TV ad up here. So let me just show you a couple other ways that we did this to bring this to life in a disruptive ways. So, uh, oh, I thought I'd forget that. I mean, uh, I thought I'd forget. Everyone should go to Gumford Center. Uh, we have a station takeover there. And Beth has reminded, I mean, uh, Susie's reminded me now. 10 times, I finally remembered. Um, but we also do things like this. This is gonna break news you walk by. So taking something old and stayed, like transit and out of home and having some fun with it. We've also been really focused the last couple of years on innovation as well in the digital space. Sip, 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 sip it on that. Facebook Messenger. We basically upload a picture and it turns into bean art, coffee bean art, really fun, fun and unique way. And then we spent a lot of time in the AR space the last couple of years. We're really starting to get a lot of learnings from it. We knew right away it's not going to be gangbusters taking over everything, but the learnings we're getting from it and the response we're getting to those people who are inter interacting with it is phenomenal. We have this last year. So that's it. So in summation, over the last five years at Panera, everything we did was in service of building trust amongst our core consumers. That had to be the for that had to be the backbone of everything we did. And then as marketers, we made sure we were as relevant as possible in every tactic we did. And relevance wasn't enough for us because again, relative to our competition, sometimes we didn't have as much to spend, so we had to make sure we disrupted. So whether that be disrupting the category, disrupting disrupting a medium, whatever we could do find ways to break through the clutter. That's what I think where we've been excelling at. I, I could be proud of the team. I think they have a phenomenal team we've built up. Um, and we've had senior leaders who've all been very supportive of us doing this. Again, I, that idea of being fearless. Whether, whether Burger King was right or wrong, I have to at least give them credit for going for it, right? And I think that's something that I always want to make sure we do at Panera moving forward, too. So with that, I'll end and uh, take any questions.